you've got 10,400 books to start. There's one book written every week since he died. By the time you get book thousand, dude, I think it's got to be a lot of speculation. We then glean the best of the best. So I don't think it's a history lesson, I think it's a character study with violence, with action, with everything you've got. I think you've got everything in there. Historical accuracy. It's the standard by which every biopic is inevitably judged. You could watch the most technically impressive historical epic ever filmed with impeccable costuming, expansive sets, and all-time great performances. And the first thing most people will ask as the credits roll is, did that really happen? In a way, this makes sense. Biopics are sold to us as historical reenactments, promising to tell a true story about real people and events, so it seems only fair to judge them by how faithful they are to that real world history. But do films based on true events have an obligation to absolute historical fidelity? Is a biopic only worthwhile if it meticulously recreates the events of its subject's life? Or is there also value in employing a certain degree of creative license in pursuit of a less literal truth? It's a complex question with no easy answers. On one hand, regardless of whether filmmakers want to be custodians of history or not, Biopics play a significant role in shaping how we remember history. Biographies and history books aren't exactly bestsellers at the moment, and documentaries don't light up the box office, meaning biopics are often the primary way people engage with history for better or worse. Uh, sadly, this is just where we're at. So you could argue that excessive creative liberties cross into historical revisionism, which can have dangerous real-world consequences. But on the other hand, creative liberties are a necessary part of adaptation. Unlike a written biography, biopics are constrained by their runtime. We expect films to have a discernible throughline from beginning to middle to end with each development feeling causally related. People's life stories are seldom so elegantly structured. As a result, biopics are, by necessity, more impressionistic than literal. They have to distill a person's whole messy life into a single coherent narrative. It's for that reason I find it hard to agree with those who argue a biopic's merit begins and ends with its historical accuracy. While the details of someone's life are important, it's unrealistic to expect these films to be beat-for-beat reenacted statements of history. That said, what I'd argue is essential for a biopic to get right is the essence of its subject, capturing who that person was and how they saw the world. You can consolidate and modify the details of someone's life story to create a more cohesive story, but so long as you remain true to who the person you're depicting was, you can avoid the nastier consequences of outright revisionism. Which brings me to Ridley Scott's But before we go any further, if you want to be a master tactician like Napoleon on the battlefield, then you're going to want to hone your skills, master geometry, and most importantly, stay sharp with today's sponsor, Brilliant. The way you learn with Brilliant is super intuitive and easy. Their lesson layout and way of engaging with you is super effective and makes learning things on a daily basis so easy. This kind of learning has been proven to be six times more efficient than the regular boring lectures you could sit through. Everything you learn in Brilliant, you learn by doing creating drag and drop coding, forming charts and graphs, and so much more. The way they present new information makes even the most abstract ideas and concepts easy to understand and relate to. At the end of the day, you'll actually understand what you're learning, which isn't that the whole point of honing a new skill of learning? You wanna be able to practice it, retain it. So to try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash filmspeak or click the link in the description. The first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Again, that's brilliant.org slash filmspeak for a free 30-day trial. Seriously, don't miss this. Brilliant rules. I've used their stuff before and I feel like I've gotten smarter myself, which I definitely need that because after this take, whew, 
yeah, you all are probably thinking I'm a big dummy, so, but thank you so much to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. I'll be honest, this was one of the harder videos for me to conceptualize, strangely enough, because it's been almost impossible to talk about this film without stumbling into discourse about whether the creative liberties it takes with Napoleon's life story are insignificant or downright damning. Usually, I wouldn't wade into something like this because I'm not exactly qualified to speak on history, but with Napoleon, I think I have a fairly decent leg to stand on, if you will. While I'm no Napoleonic scholar, I've read a fair bit about the man, including Andrew Roberts' gargantuan biography, Napoleon, a life. And while I'm well aware the film is rife with small inaccuracies, I think it succeeds at painting a portrait of the man Napoleon may have been, which I haven't really seen it get much credit for. From its first trailer, Napoleon made discerning fact from fiction about the infamous French monarch its primary selling point. It promised to disentangle Napoleon the man from Napoleon the myth, or at the very least, highlight the very ways in which the man conformed with and contrasted against the legendary image he forged for himself. In addition to taking liberties to streamline the narrative and place Napoleon in the heart of the action, such as putting him in the crowd for Marie Antoinette's execution, or on the front lines of Borodino and Waterloo, Scott and screenwriter David Scarpa also incorporated numerous homages to famous artwork of Napoleon. Unlike other liberties taken by the filmmakers, these references serve to deconstruct the mythology surrounding Napoleon, directly quoting pieces that have contributed to our cultural perception of the French leader in order to subvert them. Two notable paintings recreated in the film are Jean-Léon Jérôme's Oedipus and Maurice Orange's Bonaparte at the Pyramids. Both of these paintings are considered iconic images of Napoleon and have informed the way we remember him to this very day. But Scott isn't simply interested in recreating them to replicate the grandeur they convey. He's deliberately evoking an image we strongly associate with the man in order to challenge it. Scott's quote of Oedipus is immediately followed by the now infamous scene of Napoleon's troops firing cannons at the Great Pyramids. Similarly, his homage to Bonaparte at the Pyramids gives way to a comedic beat in which Joaquin Phoenix's Napoleon climbs onto a crate to put himself at eye level with the ancient pharaoh, only for that moment to linger awkwardly, as if to punctuate its utter insignificance, despite Napoleon's desire for it to be profound. In both cases, Scott deliberately subverts the mythologized image of Napoleon to create a visual shorthand for the way in which Napoleon's conquest of Egypt reflected his fundamental character flaws. Rather than simply showing us Napoleon at the Sphinx because it's an image we recognize, the film uses the juxtaposition between that heroic composition and the immediate bombardment of the pyramid to make a point. That despite the mythology we've created around Napoleon, he was nothing more than a petty vandal who destroyed things to further his ambitions. He may not have literally fired a shot at the pyramids, but the image of him doing so symbolizes the very real destruction his campaign in Egypt wrought. Likewise, visually quoting the image of Napoleon gazing into a sarcophagus only to have it devolve into a comedy beat that undercuts his self-importance reveals the naked egotism that would ultimately lead Napoleon to betray the revolution he once served and crown himself Emperor. Scott and Scarpa take a similar approach to the Battle of Austerlitz, playing into mythology rather than history to make a broader point about who Napoleon was. Many historians have taken issue with how much the film emphasizes Napoleon breaking the ice under his enemy's feet. Historical records tell us that this event probably wasn't as significant to the victory as Napoleon made it out to be. Yet, the filmmakers chose to depict the myth of thousands of retreating soldiers being violently plunged into the icy lake anyway. I've seen some people accuse this scene of aggrandizing Napoleon, but I think it'd be a mistake to suggest the film is taking Napoleon's version of events at face value. While it does depict his description of the battle, the framing casts it in a totally different light. Scott frames it as an act of petty revenge, deliberately placing the sequence directly after a scene in which Austria rebuffs France's request for an alliance. This clearly contextualizes his actions as retribution. Whether the maneuver was as effective as Napoleon described is ultimately less important than the fact he intended to slaughter an already retreating army as callous and vengeful. 
Again, like with the sequences in Egypt, Scott is taking creative liberties with the history in order to reveal a more abstract truth about Napoleon's character and worldview. And sure, this could have just as easily been achieved by showing Napoleon exaggerating the story after the fact, but depicting the act of drowning the soldiers is far more viscerally impactful than simply having him tell an exaggerated story through dialogue would have been. You've heard me preach it on the channel millions of times, but show not tell. It's the most important thing you can do in storytelling. It may not be how things actually went down, but it creates a powerful visual that conveys the depravity of his spite. At the end of the day, film is a visual medium, and Scott and Scarpa take creative liberties with the history in order to create images that reveal character, which in my opinion is the most important aspect of storytelling. Joaquin Phoenix's performance beautifully complements this more deconstructive approach to Napoleon. In theory, Napoleon is the ideal vanity project for an actor. He's one of the most significant and recognizable figures in all of human history, yet we don't have any footage of them, so you're free to put your own spin on the man. Not only that, but it's a role that's all but guaranteed to get an actor awards recognition. The Academy sure does love an actor playing a historical figure, after all. And while Joaquin Phoenix probably won't get nominated for Best Actor this year because there's just so many incredible performances, many of which are better, I would say, than this one, but with that in mind, it'd be easy to buy into the hype and give a grandiose, self-important performance with the kind of mentality of, oh, I'm going to get an Oscar nomination for this. You need only look at almost every other Oscar Beatty biopic about a famous person to see what that looks like. But Joaquin Phoenix is anything but self-indulgent as Napoleon, and this is why he's one of the greatest actors of our generation. He's remarkably timid in the role and reserved, almost the exact opposite of what you'd expect. But it isn't one note either. There's an undercurrent of simmering nastiness to the way he plays him that feels as though it's about 10 seconds from exploding out, which makes the moments when he finally does erupt into a petulant tantrum feel all the more uncomfortable. This awkward characterization is compounded by the fact that he's put into these highly mythologized scenarios. Like, sure, you can complain about the fact the film has Napoleon leading the cavalry charge in battles he wasn't even on the battlefield for, but Phoenix plays these moments with such angst and bewilderment that it feels intentionally subversive. The mythic Napoleon, this is not. That said, while this is far from a romantic portrayal of Napoleon, it's not a mocking caricature either. Much like the real man, Phoenix's Napoleon contains multitudes. He may not have an elite education or know the proper etiquette of high society, shortcomings that Scott repeatedly contrasts against the stuffy self-seriousness of the upper class to great comedic effect, I would add. Here yeah, there's a dark side to Joaquin, but there's also a great comical side to him. So you've got a massive You've got a huge choice between those two colors. But the film never makes Napoleon a fool. His gift for battlefield strategy is front and center throughout the film, as is his keen ability to read people, whether it's the Tsar of Russia, his wife, or the people of France. Phoenix plays Napoleon as brutish but cunning, an outsider who strives to be taken seriously by his peers and superiors, but lacks the status and station to realize that goal. His position as an underdog makes him inherently compelling, inviting the audience to see themselves in Napoleon the same way the French people did at the time. But the secret to this is that Scott and Phoenix never cast him in an outright sympathetic light. For as much as we're meant to take a degree of pleasure in watching him clash with the snobby elites both at home and abroad, Phoenix is equally as contemptible as those elite, a bitter man who, when given the opportunity to dismantle the hierarchy he has labored under his entire life, chose instead to sell out his cause for a chance at joining the upper echelons of society. In a very real way, Phoenix's performance feels deliberately designed to emphasize the fact that Napoleon was a class trader, a status chaser who desperately wanted the respect of people who hated him for his lack of pedigree. This desire to be accepted into the upper class, clashing against the fact it's a club he'll never be allowed into regardless of how much wealth and power he amasses, 
is what motivates his petulance, making his outbursts both amusing and revealing. To put it another way, Phoenix plays Napoleon as the butt of the joke, but he never treats him as an unserious character. His personality flaws make him funny, but he's never making decisions based on what will get the biggest laugh. The whole performance is driven by his commitment to the character. Another interesting aspect to Napoleon's petulance throughout the film is how it's juxtaposed with the behavior of other European monarchs, who can be just as childish and petty as Napoleon, seducing his estranged wife to get a rise out of him and scoffing at his improper etiquette. It implicitly begs the question, how is Napoleon any different from these more quote-unquote legitimate monarchs? Why is Napoleon a tyrant, while equally vain, rash behavior by the King of Austria or the Tsar of Russia are considered legitimate statecraft? Sure, Napoleon gives himself near unlimited power and uses it with reckless abandon, but is that any different to what other monarchs do? The only difference is he wasn't born into it. It's not in his blood, and so the other monarchs look down on him as illegitimate. Honestly, this is something I wish the film had focused on a bit more because it's so fascinating to me. While it's definitely in there, it's often relegated to the margins of the story. The most the film lingers on it is during Napoleon's crusade to produce an heir, establishing a hereditary monarchy that his advisors claim will lend him in France greater legitimacy. We're also shown Napoleon's attempts to marry into other royal families in an effort to borrow their legitimacy. But this thread more or less takes a back seat to the interpersonal drama of Napoleon's complicated relationship with his wife, Josephine. And while I think this was probably the right thing to focus on for this particular film, it would have been really cool to get a better look at the political ramifications of Napoleon's reign. Not only in how opposition to his reign exposed the hypocrisy of the other European monarchs, but also the way Napoleon's ascension to the throne betrayed the democratic and egalitarian ideals of the revolution. I can't begrudge the film for having different priorities, but the little nods to these bigger political ideas throughout the film left me wanting more, and hopefully we will get more in that four-hour director's cut. The story is essentially told through Napoleon's eyes, or rather, through his words. In real life, Napoleon was a prolific letter writer, penning up to 33,000 letters over the course of his adult life, and these letters, particularly his famous letters to Josephine, serve as the film's framing device. As a result, we often aren't privy to the broader societal impact of his reign. We're fixed to his perspective. And if you know anything about Napoleon, much of that perspective revolves around his obsessive infatuation with his wife, Josephine. I didn't go into Napoleon expecting a romance movie, but I'll be damned if it isn't one, albeit not a particularly wholesome romance film, but nevertheless. It's the story of two people entering into an extremely unhealthy relationship and ultimately coming to depend on each other's companionship. At first, Josephine, played brilliantly by Vanessa Kirby, sees Napoleon's near uncontrollable lust for her as an opportunity to regain the status she lost during the revolution. She marries him because of his rank and his ambition to climb even higher up the ladder. In a very literal sense, she cucks him, which is why this movie is essentially cuck the movie, but you know, we're not gonna we're not gonna get in there, but sleeping around with other men while denying him the emotional and physical intimacy he craves. A craving born from an equally unhealthy relationship with his mother. In the beginning, there's this kind of Lady Macbeth quality to Josephine, a scheming wife using her husband for her own selfish ends. But as their relationship develops, you get a sense that these two people really do care for each other in their own fucked up way. It might not be a healthy love, but it's love nevertheless. When Josephine is unable to conceive a child, she becomes distraught, expecting to be cast aside for her failure. But she isn't. Driven by his desire to create a dynasty, Napoleon divorces Josephine, but he doesn't abandon her. He sets her up on an estate and visits frequently, and then when his son is born by another woman, he immediately brings him to Josephine to hold as if it were her own. In Napoleon's eyes, Josephine was his soulmate, and that unwavering commitment, in spite of his many, 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 many flaws, 
was a comfort for Josephine, a comfort that grew into genuine affection. And while I said the film doesn't wade into the wider political implications of Napoleon's reign, that wasn't entirely true, because in a very real sense, Josephine's toxic yet enduring relationship with Napoleon serves as a proxy for Napoleon's relationship to the French people, which is probably my favorite aspect of this film. I thought that was such a brilliant framing device for it. Like Josephine, the French turned to Napoleon out of desperation following the brutality of the reign of terror and the instability of the Republic government, which had become fractured by internal politics. He represented stability, and so they latched onto him despite his obvious flaws. But this relationship was unhealthy. While Napoleon's love for France ran deep, it was obsessive. He didn't just want to care for France, he wanted to control it, demanding absolute obedience from his subjects. Napoleon's increasingly dictatorial rule isn't shown to us in the streets of Paris, but rather through his increasingly authoritarian tendencies in his domestic life. He starts exerting more control over Josephine, paralleling his tighter grip on France, which culminates in his coronation as emperor. But this absolute control creates blowback. Just like his broken marriage, Napoleon is eventually cast out of France, only to be welcomed back with open arms. In a perverse way, the French people, like Josephine, still love Napoleon despite his abuse of power. The film even makes a point to juxtapose Josephine's death with Napoleon's final defeat at Waterloo. Despite the fact these events took place almost a year apart, this creative liberty makes explicit the parallels between Napoleon's loss of Josephine to his loss of France. The film hammers this metaphor home in its epilogue. Frail and exiled on St. Helena, we get one final letter from Josephine, although unlike the others, this isn't a real letter. It's an imaginary letter. Writing to her lover from beyond the grave, Josephine reflects on their life together and posits that were they to do it all again in another life, she should take control rather than letting him loose, as all it did was lead to his self-destruction. While on its surface this monologue is clearly about their relationship, it also reads as France itself speaking to Napoleon in his final moments, lamenting his lust for power and suggesting that if the country were to do everything over, perhaps they would try to govern themselves rather than letting someone like Napoleon seize control. It's a poignant beat, delivered with real pathos by Vanessa Kirby, a people embodied in one person, reflecting on their complicated relationship to a man who, despite his undying love, did awful things and betrayed his oath. I'm probably not doing the speech justice, but it was an unexplicably stirring note to end the film on, bringing what had been subtext for the entire movie to the surface in a final address to the lead character, not judging or condemning him for his actions, but pitying him. For as thoughtful and interesting as I find the film's exploration of Napoleon and Josephine's relationship, the film is not without its shortcomings. It is about as straightforward as a biopic as you can imagine, with a strictly linear structure which makes the time jump sometimes feel a little abrupt. Like any biopic, the story is abridged for the sake of creating a cohesive narrative, but the linear progression makes those abridgments stand out in a way that they do not in films like Oppenheimer, which uses non-linear cross-cutting to mask the fact it's condensing the story of Oppenheimer's life. This is something I think could be alleviated by a director's cut. Obviously, I think we're going to get a lot more of Napoleon and all the little connective tissue is going to help bring this thing together in a more cohesive way, and apparently we're going to get it on Apple TV Plus sometime next year. But while I don't think the theatrical cut feels like it's missing anything important, I do think a longer cut could help some of these time jumps feel slightly less abrupt. And yet, despite any issues I might have with the structure or how straightforward it was, I can't say I wasn't totally enthralled the entire time, despite the fact that it would have been kind of cool to have, you know, French accents in the film. That would have been great. 
Ridley Scott is a true master of this kind of historical epic, and Napoleon is a welcome return to the genre, echoing the likes of Gladiator and the director's cut of Kingdom of Heaven. No one shoots a battle sequence quite like Ridley Scott, and the use of physical locations and sets filled with hundreds of extras gives the film a sense of scale and prestige that is often lacking in other modern attempts at the genre. Napoleon is fittingly dwarfed by his surroundings, an effect that makes his outbursts feel all the more pitiful. If it weren't for the more irreverent approach to its lead character, you could easily mistake this film for one of the great historical epics of old. And that, I think, is ultimately what makes this film stand out most to me. It feels like something familiar filtered through a decidedly modern lens. Ridley Scott's sensibilities as a director are as traditional as they've ever been, but his approach to story has the bite of a much riskier filmmaker. With Napoleon, Scott has essentially co-opted the visual language of the classical historical epic to make an idiosyncratic character study about one of history's most complicated political Political figures. As you walk out of Napoleon, or if you're catching this much later on streaming, you're not going to have a complete picture of the events that comprise Napoleon's life, but you might just have a better understanding of who the man was and why we're still so fascinated by him over two centuries after his death. And maybe that's all a worthwhile biopic needs to do.